Good morning, cinema and modernism is our topic for today's lecture and we are going to deal with what is modernism very briefly and uh, <coughs> the factors that led to its growth. Um, we are going to look at uh, uh, some of the major inventions and uh, inventors of this period, uh, particularly with reference to cinema. And uh, theoretically, we should know what uh, Walter Benjamin's ideas are as contained in the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. So, we will be talking about that in, in this is the essay in which he talks extensive, extensively about visual arts, particularly cinema. So, what is modernism? Modernism as a movement, so it is a movement remember came into prominence after the first world war. Before that we had the Victorian period and modernism marks a break with Victorian bourgeoisie mentality and morality and rejects at least aspires to reject the 19th century optimism and often presents a deeply pessimistic picture of a culture in transition. So, at some level modernism was a response to the ordered, stable and inherently meaningful world view of the 19th century that is the Victorian period. So, it often interrogates uh, uh, the meaning of anything you know stable meaning of uh, of the world, of the world view or the world around us. So, uh, uh, the idea was that the world view which was in prevalence till then was not enough to comprehend the anarchy, the chaos of the 20th century. And uh, in literature of course, you have T. S. Eliot and his uh, the Wasteland famous poem, which uh, almost uh, is considered uh, as one of the most important prominent texts of this period. Also, Ezra Pound's Cantos. So, these are the literary background, this is the literary background of modernism. Now, uh, cinema originated and it is very interesting that it coincided with the period that we, that is usually referred to as the modernist period. Hmm? World around us was changing, too many new things happening, ideas, inventions and then we came across, I mean we witnessed the birth of cinema. So, Thomas Elva Edison, I do not think anyone here needs any introduction to Thomas Elva Edison and he patented his invention of the kinestoscope in 1891, okay, but that before that we also had cinema in its various forms. So, um, cinema as we know it today traces its origin to the 1890s, when penny arcade kinetoscopes were in rage. Can anyone tell me what are these things? Penny arcade. <coughs> kinetoscopes. As cinema started, you know we were talking about the Lumiers, we were talking about jo George Melier, people who began making cinema. So, who, uh, what is what is a penny arcade kinetoscope? Is it the one where many pictures uh, No, tell me what is a penny arcade, penny, penny, penny. Coin, coin. coin, you drop a coin and watch something, you know, there, there would be that kind of an instrument, you get it, right. So, the and, and the projection is the so called projector, here projection is he would uh, rotate a handle and you would be able to see through some kind of a lens, some uh, many pictures just rolling on. Is it so? Perhaps, you know, maybe beginnings of Nickelodeon, the way we understand it today. 
So, Walter Benjamin theorizes the growth of cinema, the world of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Are you familiar with the work? Perhaps you should be doing that for your theoretical readings. So, okay, we are going to talk about that soon. Hmm? That reminds me that you are going to start your discussion of key concepts. Ranjit, please make a list and mail it to all of us. Yeah. Already some people have responded around 27? Yes. Remaining are requested to send your preferences to Ranjit. Okay, so, uh, Walter Benjamin observes that the camera was a surgeon's scalpel which laid bare the optical unconscious. So, camera never lies, camera never cheats. We are on camera right now and if you are sucking your thumb, it will show <laughs> that you are sucking your thumb. Okay, if you are smiling, if you are unhappy and if you are happy, the, I can see many happy faces right now. It will be captured. You cannot fake emotions, that is what we mean. Okay. The camera is a scalpel which lays bare the optical unconscious. Camera never lies. It is almost akin to a surgeon's scalpel. The pioneers of cinema, the way we understand cinema, of course, many of us would not be familiar with these names. But we have been talking about and as a students of cinema, you should know these names. So, the Lumiere brothers, Thomas Edison, George Melier, who are they? They are the pioneers. No, what did he do? Uh, we will talk about him. <laughs> what did he do? He was also one of those early filmmakers along with the Lumiere brothers, but more eccentric, more experimentalist. Okay. Uh, D. W. Griffith, are you aware of him? Good, birth of a nation, we will be talking about it, Lincoln. After all, Lincoln is the hottest movie of our season. So, he uh, dealt with the American Civil War, it is a silent movie, okay, and assassination of Lincoln in that film. I think parts of it uh, are available on the YouTube. Edwin S. Porter, and then filmmakers who were also actors, Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. So, um, and then of course, from Denmark, we had someone called Carl Theodor Dreher, who is a very important modernist and we should know something about him as well. So, just to recap, we have been talking about the Lumiers for quite a while. So, August and Louis, they were the brothers, brothers Lumiere and Edison's kinetoscope was a threat. So, uh, Louis worked on a machine and invented something called the cinematograph. So, you get your term cinematography from this, which was a camera and a projector in one. We have already discussed while we were talking about realism, workers leaving the Lumiere factory, which was made in 1895 and the arrival of a train at a station. And we are told, if you read bits of cinema history, which is a very interesting area, that when a live audience really watched a train arriving at a station, that movie, they were startled, they were scared they started running around if that train would come char charging towards them on them. Okay. So, that was the effect of cinema, something like uh, people had never seen before. Okay. So, Lumias were also uh, noted for introducing the first ever special effects. So, before mat matrix, you had the Lumias, okay, who no introduced the first ever special effect in cinema. In a, it was called the demolition of a wall. And if you go to the YouTube, you will find it over there, in which reverse motion was used to rebuild a wall. You understand reverse motion. In cinema, often it is done to create a comic effect, everything going backwards. Okay, so, that is what they did for the first time in 1895, which was uh, uh, quite a feat for those days. Uh, we were talking about George Melier. He was a conjurer, a magician, 
a cartoonist and inventor. So, a um, truly multifaceted uh, talent and he started using trick photography and developed devices such as superimposition and stop motion. What can anyone give me example of a superimposition? I can always show you a clipping, but what you understand by superimposition? No one into photography here? You take a different background and you impose, perhaps overlap it, but overlap has more, has multi layers to it. Superimposition is just you take an image and impose it to on something. I mean, I will give you some very common, yes, uh, yeah. Is it in uh, Citizen Kane with issues, Aradu, and they uh, focus on Charles Foster Kane and he says Rosebud, because mm -hmm. in the background, if I remember correctly, they show something else in the background. Perhaps, okay. So, that is a, uh, a more sophisticated use, but I will give you a very crude use of a superimposition. Many a time, uh, without going to the Taj Mahal, studios use the image of Taj Mahal, okay, and then you get me what I am trying to yeah. say, yeah, somebody comes and you do not have to really go to Eiffel Tower or to Paris, okay, it is there in the studio and just stand in front of it. So, it is like the image is already there and you are superimposed on that. So, a more clever way of doing it. So, there were some certain filmmakers who were extremely adept with superimposition, but George Melia was the first to introduce it and he adapted Jules Verne's La Voyage de la Lune or A Trip to the Moon. So, Jules Verne, uh, the famous science fiction writer around the world in 80 days okay, and we have also seen the wonderful adaptation with Jackie Chan and Steve Coogan. Okay, watch the movies, but uh, Jules Verne would turn in his grave or that is another way of that, but uh, uh, someone said that they like. Uh, um, Jackie Chan a lot. So, you know it is a treat for his fans. So, Trip to the Moon was an important uh, movie by George Melie and you watch it, it is available I think on the net and um, the moon does all sorts of things there. It is smiles, it weeps and it, it changes colors. So, use of trick photography those days. Uh, it is almost like uh, later on it was uh, developed as freeze, okay. but stop motion was the first term used for it. Later on people like uh, the new new wave filmmakers like Truffaut etcetera, Godard, they perfected the art. Okay. D. W. Griffith, father of cinema. Okay. So, cinema has several fathers and D. W. Griffith was uh, perhaps uh, the father of the film narrative, because see the trip a trip to the moon and workers leaving the Lumiere building factory, uh, they were like shorts, not even shorts, a clip 30 seconds or one minute uh, businesses, but here we are talking about a man who developed a narrative. We are soon going to do classic narrative, classic Hollywood cinema, classic Indian cinema. Okay, so the way stories would be told, so that he was the pioneer here. He was a student of Edwin S. Potter and Edwin S. Potter had made a movie called The Great Train Robbery in 1903, which had a definite storyline. So, remember earlier there was no story, you are just shooting something which is a happening, a train arriving, moon, it is there. Uh, uh, workers leaving a factory, yes, fine, so, but it is not a, f they are not telling a story, they are just capturing um, uh, certain scenes from day to day life, you know, man on a, man with a movie camera, okay, that is another experiment. But before all that, the great train robbery was one of the first known film to use a storyline. Okay. Anyone are familiar with this, the great train robbery? Uh, not exactly. Not exactly. I'm talking about 1903 and the first movie, which is the running length of which is uh, 10 to 15 minutes. 
Uh, I doubt it, but perhaps. So, there is a train robbery, there is actually a train, there are actually robbers and uh, uh, it is that you know bang bang shoot shoot kind of a film, okay, where robbers come and shoot uh, around and rob a train and after that they are chased by the sheriff and the people and they are captured and they, some of them are gunned down. So, that is the story, okay, but it is it's a story and it was a huge hit. A massive hit, I mean seeing all these things on screen. And later on Griffith made his most famous work, Birth of a Nation, that was 1915. So, look at the rapid developments, 1891 you are making, uh, or 1895 you are making a movie like Workers Leaving the Factory and within uh, 10 years of it you are making something which has a definite storyline and after that a full length feature film, Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation is set during the civil war and it is outrageously racist. <laughs> it is completely biased in favor of the, the white people, people who owned slaves. And the blacks are not played by, uh, uh, to my understanding, they are not played by black actors, but white people with faces painted black. So, it gives a very unnatural, very annoying look to the film, but it was a huge hit because it was giving the people what they wanted to see. And blacks are represented, you know, the evil blacks, the binaries are very clear there, the evil blacks versus the good white. So, the white are moral, hard working, honest, the blacks are rapists, killers, robbers. So, that is the way it was represented. And at one point the movie also blatantly support the notorious group, Ku Klux Klan. You can look up these groups. And the film was one of the first known blockbusters, okay, a smash hit. And of course, uh, assassination of uh, Abraham Lincoln. And the movie was also remembered for this, for a very realistic de depiction of the assassination of Lincoln. So, uh, uh, the movie although a huge uh, or a hugely successful film, it was uh, uh, panned by critics for the racist overtones. And as if to atone for this sin, okay, later on Griffith made a movie called Intolerance. And intolerance is all about, uh, you know, it advocates racial integration. Any comments, any observations here? All these, we are still talking about uh, silent cinema. Okay, which was the first talkie? Good, the jazz singer, okay, which came much later. And if you have watched the sound of music, oh, I am so sorry, uh, singing in the rain, singing in the rain. How many of you have watched singing in the rain? Oh, not too, too many. Okay, uh, you ought to watch singing in the rain. Note it down. Will it be available? Yeah. It is okay. If it is, please do watch Singing in the Rain, directed by Stanley Donnan with Gene Kelly. And it tells you all about what happened to cinema with the advent of talking pictures, talkies. Okay, so, after the World War, the Treaty of Versailles was signed in June 1919. And these were the major events that were taking place and how these, they affected, influenced the development of technology and cinema in particular. So, the collapse of Wall Street in 1929, Hitler coming to power as Chancellor of Germany in 1933 and uh, President Roosevelt launched a very populist 
New Deal as a response to the economic depression in America. So, because so many such because of such uh, uh, major social political upheavals, there was a new socio political order which resulted in new artistic modes offering radical perspectives on the prevailing conditions. So, it just does not appear in a vacuum, there has to be certain kind of a socio political condition which leads to certain kind of a cinema or art. Art is always grounded in uh, the way uh, social political conditions exist. I mean, we talk about post liberalization today, do not we? Okay, do you think post liberalization and let us stick to cinema, let us not go into political or economic order now. But there is something called post liberalization 90s onwards. Do you sense a change in cinema? Do you see sense uh, in some way cinema is a responding to it? How? Our own cinema, how is it how is it responding? I mean it post liberalization is not felt in Europe. Okay. It is not felt somewhere in a, in the US perhaps. You, globalization, yes. Impact of globalization, multiculturalism, yes. Thematically, technically, do you feel li post liberalization in impacting our cinema? Language terms? Uh, uh, themes. Let us talk about themes. Okay. Ideas about taboos could not be talked about, such as divorce and things like that. Give me one uh, uh, key feature of liberalization. What did liberalization do to us? Commercialization. Exactly, commercialization. Do you feel, see, before liberalization, cinema was uh, the values it projected, at least on a screen, was like uh, is good to be middle class, it is it, very satisfying to be, uh, to remain where you are. Okay. Uh, you need not have those upwardly mobile social economic aspirations. If you watch post liberalization cinema, you feel okay, that thematically it has been liberated from those confinements. Do not you feel so? I mean, oe lucky lucky oe. Okay. It's a very good example, uh, lower middle class boy trying to break away with the shag shackles. I mean, Shanghai for example, is a response to uh, uh, forces of liberalization. You have one part of India, one India which does not recognize that another India exists. That is what Shanghai is all about. Do duni char, yes. Why cannot a teacher own a car? Yeah, so, this is what we are. So, social aspirations have changed and that's have, that has become an integral theme of our cinema. Okay. And of course, thematically also we have changed. I mean, look at Dev D. Hmm. So, and it is also very interesting that we are now looking at that kind of cinema which is more and more grounded in Indian society. Indian, they talk about Indian cities and Indian towns, life in a metro. Okay. Uh, even some of the films which are set in a small towns, Ishkia, Abhishek Chaube's Ishkia, right? Set in a yeah, but very very modern it's in its theme. So cinema always related to society. Now uh, Carl Theodor Dreher was uh, uh, he started his career with leaves from satan's book which is a work inspired by d w griffith's intolerance he is from denmark and his monumental work is the passion of joan of arc 1928 a phenomenal work of course none of you need any introduction to who joan of arc was you know who she was but it was the way the story was dealt with and Dreher uh, was one of the first without all these fancy labels. He was the first one who uh, made his actors go through some kind of a training for 
uh, for acting. Okay. So, he would make them rehearse and rehearse and rehearse to such an extent that they would be exhausted and then he would capture them on camera, because Joan of Arc, okay, however pretty she must have been in uh, real life, but while you are in jail and you are starving and you are uh, persecuted, you cannot remain beautiful and glamorous. Okay. In, a, in a commercial movie, yes you would, but not in the kind of movie, movies Dreher made. So, Joan of Arc and you can, while she is being subjected to uh, inquisition by the clerks. Okay, so, Dreher is an important master, we will be talking about his cinema during this, uh, during our course. And then let us move on to another major pioneer of uh, modernism and cinema, the comic master. So, first we will talk about Charlie Chaplin, does not need much of an introduction and he is credited with a slapstick style. You know that he was, uh, uh, he was born in England, yeah, he migrated to the US at some point, but he was uh, a British national. And of course, uh, so why, why was he, he, why did his movies touched so many people? Well, his combination, his unique combination of slapstick comedy style and sentimentalism. So, if you watch The Kid for example, one of the most sentimental films, The Champ. And Chaplin would excel in playing the underdog. Gold Rush is another important movie in 1925, where he becomes a gold prospector. And in the movie, some of the <laughs> memorable scenes are where a starving Chaplin boils and then eats his own boot with relish. And it is considered one of the greatest, that was the high point of his career. City Lights is another uh, triumph with its blend of melodrama and physical comedy. And he is the little tramp here who is moved, I mean that was his image, right? The tramp, a little tramp, you know the bowler hat, the walking stick, the, the coat. Okay, so, um, we were talking about semiotics. So, even today, if someone, uh, an actor who wears a bowler hat, and a little moustache, you know, Charlie Chaplin, okay, so semiotics at work there. So, he, he made himself easily identifiable with the public, you know, because it was the age of the depression and he would always play the underdog in search of love, okay, and in search of, uh, you know, a, a, an underdog with a golden heart. In Hindi cinema, Raj Kapoor perfected the image, underdog, uh, orphan, always in need of receiving and giving love. Okay, the first movie with speech, that is talking picture was in 1927, The Jazz Singer, but Chaplin was convinced that speech would ruin the beauty of cinema. He did not believe in sound and soon we will be doing uh, sound and soundtracks also in this course, and then you will understand how important sound is. But at that point, Chaplin believed that cinema is an out and out visual medium, give pe the people as many images and visuals as possible without sound interfering in it. So, it, of course, si sound was also done in a very crude way, and perhaps he, perhaps he was not too convinced about it. Some of his films were presented. Uh, as a comedy romance in pantomime with little sound effect and usually he would give the music himself. Ma'am? Yeah? Was speech or is sound actually? They did not have any problem using snatches of music in order to create that kind of an imp emotional impact. Okay. He had a problem with dialogue as such. Okay. Music he, they would use because you cannot get away without using music, right. You have to, and how were they, how did they use music in those pictures? Orchestra, no, but what was the purpose? 
that is very important you know uh, to understand as it was like a background music the way the, something that today we call the background music ok. So, how did they use it to set the mood ok, to set the mood to set the tone of the year to tell people that see this is a situation where you should get emotional. <laughs> you we want you to drop tears shed tears at this point. So, we are, we are going to give you that sad violin music ok and then we will have that nice tap tap music which is supposed to make you feel good about yourself ok. So, music would tell you what to feel, but then sound has come so, music has background music has come a long way and now we deliberately use silences to create an impact, but then that is all because of the sophistication of sound and soundtrack ok, that is another area to explore ok. So, modern times, modern times where uh, which is an indictment of crass capitalism and industrialization is another important Chaplin movie and where he uh, satirizes assembly line production you know the Fordist tendencies. And there is a scene where you feel that a simple worker has become yes a part of the machines around him here yeah, you remember the scene the food where, where he has been. yes. So, this is what I was talking about the point where after hours of hard labor the little tram gets a lunch break where he sits with a bowl of soup twitching to the rhythm of the machine. Chaplin pantomimes his way through this film and uh, the uh, definitely it is a movie which is full of warmth for the workers of, uh, and of the working millions. And if you remember Chaplin was blacklisted from Hollywood, do you know the background? There was something called McCarthy period ok, what happened during <coughs> McCarthy period? People were labeled as traitors anti Americans because of the so called communist tendencies. So, uh, several filmmakers suffered Alaya Kazan for example. And that is Alaya Kazan, Alaya Kazan therefore, was blacklisted by <laughs> everyone <laughs> then, then he tried to save himself ok, but uh, great director let us not take away anything for the political ideologies aside Alaya Kazan was the greatest film director in my opinion ever. I mean the body of work is amazing, uh, Splendor in Grass, East of Eden, Streetcar Named Desire ok, e, yeah on the waterfront which was a response to HUAC House and American Activities Committee. So, Chaplin was also blacklisted during the Hollywood McCarthyism and the blacklisting of its so called communists and he was in exile, he lived in exile for several years and then uh, he never returned to America for a very long time till the early 70s. And who invited him back? Who worked to get him back? Any guesses in the 70s who could have been instrumental in getting him back to America? And he was given a lifetime achievement award for at the Oscars, which we usually give to people like you know, just calm down, we never recognized you in uh, when you were at your peak. Now, we are giving you a candy, be satisfied with it. So, Chaplin and also Hitchcock, ok, they were never awarded or rewarded or appreciated, and it hurt them immensely of course, but uh, Chaplin was brought back for a short time uh, from England and other parts of Europe and uh, uh, he was honored with a lifetime academy award, but my question is who can you hazard a guess who could have been uh, instrumental, who were the group, the, what was the group that could have been behind. Marx oh Marx Brothers, I mean we are talking about the early 70s. People like Scorsese, people like Scorsese, people like uh, Coppola, people like Warren Beatty, ok, people who pioneered or ushered in the counter culture movement and therefore, they felt that old world has to change ok and therefore, you cannot go on uh, humiliating or neglecting the pioneers of cinema. So, Chaplin was brought back because of their efforts and they also made a documentary 
and honored them and his lifetime achievement very significantly his uh, uh, lifetime achievement award came in the same year as uh, when the godfather received its oscars as the best film etc godfather uh, how many oscars did it win three good best cinematography best, best cinematography. picture actor. and best actor for brando and where he acted up and refused to take it refused to accept it that's another drama Buster Keaton, anyone knows who he was? Buster Keaton, good. So, Buster Keaton, again a contemporary of Chap Chaplin's, started in film with a, a very renowned comedian, Fatty Arbuckle in 1917. I would like you to look up Fatty Arbuckle not because he was fat, okay, but there was a huge, huge scandal surrounding him and I do not want to talk about that right now. Okay. So, I want you to understand what Hollywood machinery was all about, because there was a huge controversy about Fatty Arbuckle, who was a major star of the silent era comedian and what he did and what the, stu the, the lens to which the studios went to uh, do a cover up job. Okay, so, it always happened, okay, media management. So, Keaton was a genius as well as a masterful filmmaker and, and his movies are known for their immaculate attention to details and this he always had a deadpan expression on his face. You must watch the general. Today, many people rate him superior to Charlie Chaplin. He was less slapstick and more nuanced, more philosophical. His films also illustrated a kind of stoic and surreal quality. But watch the general, it, uh, I think this is and uh, of course, sing, singing in the rain, you must watch it. So, um, Keaton is uh, remembered for jettisoning slapstick and introducing a more subtle comic style. Who said that Rowan Atkinson is his favorite? Rowan Atkinson is more Keaton and less Chaplin, yeah. more subtle definitely more surreal. I mean, he does not go around falling all over the place, <laughs> slipping on a banana peel. So, that is slapstick. And his signature style was the stoically brave, who would brave all the odds and carry on with the struggles of life. And some of his many admirers include and they have paid homage to him in several ways on a screen. Louis Binel, Chuck Jones, Woody Allen very, very significantly, Jackie Chan and Steven Spielberg. It may not reflect in Spielberg cinema, but he has professed to be a huge admirer of Buster Keaton. And he was often called the great stone face that was his acting style. So, the general was made in 1927, considered Keaton's <coughs> greatest comedy, set, in, set during the civil war and what is the general? It is a train, it is an engine, the name of his locomotive. And Keaton's character is in love with the lo locomotive and the girl, <laughs> Annabelle Lee which is very uh, interesting because uh, set during the civil war and with a name like Lee general uh, reference, uh, reference to general Lee. And ideologically the film supports the south and we find the Yankees stealing the locomotive and much of the comedy is centered on Keaton's search 
for the general. Okay, any questions here, any comments at this point? Anything that you would like to talk about Keaton or Chaplin? Okay, so uh, what I would like you to do now, um, watch the general. Okay, because the obviously we cannot be screen we cannot be screening all these movies. Okay, also it's better these are black and white silent films, so you watch them at your own convenience. So watch the general. Watch any major movie starring Charlie Chaplin. I would recommend the Gold Rush, um, City Lights, uh, Modern Times. If possible, try to watch uh, uh, some of Buster Keaton's films also and uh, if available, try to watch Dreher because Carl Theodore Dreher, okay, his films are in French language, but I am sure something is available with some subtitles. So, Joan of Arc, which is a difficult movie to you know watch, it is a very in, difficult in the sense that it lacks the so called entertainment value. Okay, let me tell you right away. And then also, um, uh, they are very demanding films emotionally as well as intellectually. Okay, so, they do not give easy answers to easy questions. They do demand a lot of your attention. So, when you are in a good mood, <laughs> watch this film. So, Passion of Joan of Arc, that is one. And um, another movie would be by Papst, that is German filmmaker, I think William Papst and his movie called Pandora's Box. Okay, so, now while we are talking about all these people with the slapstick comedy, okay, so we the growth of cinema, right? So, especially in Hollywood. So, what, what, what is our takeaway now? What are the major developments that you just observed? Inception of cinema, and then at what level did? I mean, we stopped at general. So, can you just give me a list? How did it progress? Just take a minute, and then we'll talk about something else very quickly. According to you, what are the highlights here, whatever we have been talking about? Think of uh, cinema and its growth in terms of technology and also in terms of themes and ideas as well as ideology. So, then give me your responses. Yes. So, in terms of the highlights, first you have the first film, uh, workers <coughs> building a factory. factory. Then you have the first special effects breaking down of a wall. Then 1903, you have the first movie, the storyline, mm -hmm. uh, the Great Train Robbery. And from then you have uh, films with the political ideology like Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. 
good ok. So, we have an ideology, we have a narrative in between we also had uh, the great train robbery which told a story maybe in 5 minutes or 6 minutes, but there was something a linear story. So, we are talking about linearity in storytelling the classic narrative ok, which remained uh, a major feature of storytelling for a very long time linearity till people like Dennis Hopper perhaps easy riders they came and started interrogating the rules. Hmm? And then uh, we also uh, looked at how cinema can be a vehicle of propaganda ok ideology. So, birth of nation and because he was a gentleman <laughs> he could also he also made another movie called intolerance which is almost like an apology making a public apology for his sins of birth of nation. Okay. So, ideal. So, cinema therefore, what we are seeing is that cinema it can be a very strong medium for uh, propagation of ideas. Chaplin after all, okay, what was he doing? There was an idea, there was an ideology of course, he wanted entertainment definitely it fi films are very high uh, as far as the entertainment quotient was concerned. Okay, but there was a certain ideology about it, and the the underdog versus the capitalists. Okay, that's an underlying theme, critiquing uh, rapid industrialization, insensitive industrialization and growth. That was also critiqued. Okay, and then Buster Keaton, more refined style of acting, drear, more refined style of acting. Okay, so, breaking away from that theatrical, stagey, melodramatic posturing. So, that is the contribution of people like Dreher, Dreher and Keaton. So, there was a growth in the first 20 years of its inception, cinema witnessed rapid growth in terms of technique, in terms of themes, ideology as well as acting. Okay, so, that is the takeaway. So, we will continue to any comments? in this would be the studio culture and how the major studios started producing films. Absolutely, but all these films were a product of, yeah, they were independently made, the Lumias were a factory, so they could make a movie. But then later on uh, with the growth of his studios, cinema became something else. So, that is something we will be looking at in our subsequent classes. Thank you so much and see you tomorrow.